Hey guys, just a quick announcement before the video begins. My latest single, We Live For Rock, is available to stream online right now. It's my first single in six years, you can listen to it on Bandcamp, and it sounds like this. This ship has sailed, but it's barely left the dock. We Live For Rock! Bye! Hey everybody, back at my parents' house. Again. So a lot has happened. As I said in my last video, I graduated from college, which, you know, that's pretty cool. Now I just gotta figure out what I'm gonna do with the rest of my life. But I'm here for now, and hey, with everything about my life and the world that's changing, it's good to know that there's always one thing that will remain constant. Man, censorship is stupid! I've already talked quite a bit about censored lyrics, and honestly, I don't see that as a series I'll continue unless I manage to find 10 others for a third video. But there's one thing I haven't talked about. Album art. After all, album covers usually have a lot of thought put into them. They're meant as a first impression for the album, a sneak peek into what kind of experience the listener will be getting into, something to draw people in so they can listen to the music itself. An album cover isn't like a book cover or a movie poster, where it is likely to change with future releases. It's more like a movie's title. It is almost as intrinsic to the listening experience of the album as the music itself. There's a reason why so many great album covers become iconic in their own right, and conversely why so many bad album covers have entire YouTube series picking them apart. Album art is essential to the album itself, and once it's out there, it's not something you can simply change. Right? As a matter of fact, that's exactly what it is. Much like movie titles, there have been instances when album covers were changed after their original release. Oh, believe me, it's rare, but it happens enough to be notable for a list. Now keep in mind, I'm only counting album covers that were changed after their initial release. Album covers will often go through many changes before their release. And I'm not counting foreign release covers either, I can make an entire separate video about those. It is still common to this day for albums to be released in different countries with a different cover, title, and even track listing. Although in the era of streaming, I'm not entirely sure why. No, I'm talking specifically about when the album cover was shipped to shelves as one thing, and then for whatever reason was changed to a different thing. Hey guys, Editing Spaceman here. So, fun fact, this video took so long to edit that while I was in the process of editing, it happened again. Just last month, Paramore inexplicably changed the album cover of their 2013 self-titled album from this shot of the band to just this solo picture of Hayley Williams. I'm not entirely sure why they did this so many years later. Maybe it has something to do with former bassist Jeremy Davis's recent failed attempt at a rap career? Certainly not the first punk bassist to try that. But regardless, consider this my unofficial number 11 entry for this list. Now, back to the video. So let's not waste any more time. Let's start with number 10, which is a classic. He's a real nowhere man. Leave it to one of the most famous and well-remembered bands of all time to have one of the most famous censored album covers of all time. Yesterday and Today isn't an essential album by the Beatles. It was one of their many albums that was North America exclusive, released by Capitol Records and consisting of tracks left off the American releases of Help and Rubber Soul. Normally, it wouldn't even qualify for this list. But this album isn't best known for the music as much as its original album cover. Which featured the Beatles covered with pieces of raw meat and severed baby doll parts. Yeah, this cover was pulled as fast as possible, but not quite fast enough. Some record stores still released the album with the original cover on July 15th, 1966, before it was replaced five days later with its much less eye-catching photo of the band. This was despite the huge push to recall and replace all the covers that cost capital $250,000. Nowadays, copies with the original cover sell up to $12,000. So, what happened? Well, it's hard to say. At the time, the label said it was a satire of pop art. John Lennon said it was meant as a political commentary on the Vietnam War. The photographer, Robert Whittaker, said the cover was part of a larger concept and represented how fame could tear the band apart. A lot of critics said it was a statement about Capitol butchering their music for the American markets. Whatever the joke was, it went way over people's heads and there was controversy. Keep in mind, this was right around the same time when people were shocked and appalled by John's more popular than Jesus remark. If you want a deeper discussion about the history of this album, I'd highly recommend Vinyl Rewind's video on the Butcher cover. Even with the replaced cover art, it still went two times platinum and was shortly followed by their huge album Revolver, so it clearly didn't have that large an impact on the Beatles' popularity. Something similar would happen over two decades later with this next band, although this cover is still technically on the album. 
Appetite for Destruction by Guns N' Roses, the best-selling debut album of all time, and to this day one of the most acclaimed debut albums. The album would sell 18 million copies in the US alone and 30 million worldwide, but when it was first released, they were still just a small metal band, and the album drew some outrage with the original cover art. Now, you may be wondering why the cover features a weird crab monster attacking a robot that's clearly had his way with this young woman. But believe it or not, this cover dates way further back than 1987. All the way back to 1979, in fact, when cartoonist Robert Williams released his folio, The Lowbrow Art of Robert Williams, which featured a familiar image on the cover. This painting was, in fact, titled Appetite for Destruction. And while Williams remained more of an underground artist, by 1987 he'd gained somewhat of a cult following, including from Axl Rose. When these people originally approached me, they were unheard of, and I considered them to be just another punk rock band that comes to my door wanting artwork. I love the artwork and, and the, the talent that was involved in it, and I think that since it was such an outrageous picture... Yeah, this seems like the type of edgelord stuff Axl would be into. There have been attempts to explain this cover, saying the robot represents the industrial system metaphorically raping the environment, and the monster is the Earth getting its revenge. But regardless, when the album was originally released in 1987, feminist groups as well as the PMRC began lobbying against it, and some retailers refused to sell it. I gave them my best wishes, but I warned them that this was going to get them in a lot of trouble, and they got them in exactly the amount of trouble I thought it was going to get them into. Appetite was reissued with Billy White Jr.'s better-known art of the band members as skeletons, but the original cover was still included on the inner sleeve and still stirred up a bit of controversy, with some calling it a glorification of rape. Honestly, as much as I do love William's painting, the censored cover is even more iconic. It fits way better with the vibe of the album and helps cement the band as rock legends. Some artists are pressured by the label or moral guardians to change their covers, but others just change their cover on their own accord. Case in point, Animal Collective. In 2005, experimental pop band Animal Collective released their album Feels. It received critical acclaim and did well with fans, and the next year they followed it with People, an EP of songs recorded during the Feels sessions. I'm not entirely sure what's going on with the cover of this one. It appears to be done in the same art style as Feels, a tribute to the works of artist Henry Darger, but it's a lot more basic, showing two children with a black nanny and... Okay, we have to talk about that. This is a portrayal of a mammy, a black stereotype that other reviewers or essayists who are much more qualified than me could probably talk about in much greater detail. And when you view the title combined with the caption at the bottom, people always got to watch them at the ends. Uh... Needless to say, it was an unfortunate album cover, but from what I can tell, there was no controversy behind it. Maybe it's just because it was such a small release, but no, from what I can tell... Animal Collective changed the cover entirely on their own will. In 2020, the band put their entire backlog on Bandcamp, and with the reissue came new album art for people. We understand now that using a racist stereotype causes more damage than an explanation can repair, and we apologize, the band said, and they even pledged to donate the album's future royalties to the Equal Justice Initiative. You know, good on them for coming to that realization on their own without any of their fans pressuring them to replace it. That takes a lot of reflection. I'm still not sure if I'm a fan of the new art, though, but it's a step in the right direction. Some may see this as the band trying to rewrite history, but I don't see it that way. I think it's more of the band trying to learn from their past mistakes and do better. Now, if you want to see a band trying to rewrite history... Oh boy, we're talking about KISS again! As I said in my last video, when KISS released Creatures of the Night in 1982, they were at a low point in their careers. The album is beloved by fans now, but at the time it didn't do well because fans were still reeling from music from the Elder, so a year later the band made the surprising decision to remove their makeup and show their real faces to the world. The move... went okay, all things considered. The band became more of a pop, glam metal band, but the new sound and image brought a boost in commercial success. So in 1985, to cash in on the success, the band changed the cover of Creatures of the Night to this. The fact that they tried to rebrand this older album as a post-unmasking album is funny enough on its own, but there's one part that makes it even worse. This was KISS's first album after the departure of their founding lead guitarist Ace Frehley, the Space Ace, and the first to feature new guitarist Vinnie Vincent, the Ankh Warrior but the original cover still shows freely. You can tell because Vincent had a different makeup design. However, the 85 cover shows then-current guitarist Bruce Kulik, who also didn't play on the album. These guys had two chances to make an album cover that actually showed the guitarist who played on the album, and they botched both of them. That is hilarious to me. 
1997, Kiss donned the makeup again and the original cover was restored. And for what it's worth, there is also a popular bootleg cover that replaces Freely with Vincent. A lot of these covers are from the 80s. I wasn't alive during that time, but apparently it was quite the time for censorship, as proven with this next cover. In 1988, glam metal band Poison was on top with their highest selling album, Open Up and Say Ah, propelled by the power of hit singles such as Nothing But A Good Time and Every Rose Has Its Thorn. Now while Poison was always more of a radio friendly metal band, even they weren't free from controversy, and this album cover landed them in hot water. Mainly because it looks bad. Seriously, I don't even dislike Poison. In fact, I even saw them in concert with Motley Crue, Def Leppard, and Joan Jett a few months ago. But this album cover hasn't aged so well, and I'm not even talking about the content as much as how it's presented. The tongue is so poorly blended with the rest of the photo that it looks like it and the mouth are part of the same mass. The fangs are barely visible while the nose ring is brighter than them for some reason. And, well, now we know where Ray Park got the idea for Darth Maul. As an artist, this album cover offends me because they could have tried harder. But in 1988, this cover caused controversy among church groups because... it showed a demon lady? Not doing anything, really. Just standing there and showing off her Gene Simmons tongue. That's it. If Iron Maiden's Number of the Beast were a 10 for shock value, this would be a 2. But apparently, the mere existence of a demon lady on the cover was enough that the label reissued Open Up with a significantly cropped version, which to its credit does look better, but it wound up being changed back to the original because, yeah, why was there controversy about this again? This wasn't even Poison's only album cover to generate controversy, it happened with their follow-up album Flesh and Blood as well. Huh. Maybe this band had more of an edge than I thought. But seriously, if people in the 80s got offended over this, they'd probably have an aneurysm if they watched a second of Has Been Hotel. If you've seen Crash Thompson's first video on bad album covers, you know the story behind this one already. Basically, the British metal band Battleaxe released their debut album, Burn This Town, in 1983. And then immediately re-released the album with a different cover the next year. What had happened is the band hired an artist friend of theirs to draw a proof of concept sketch for the cover, an idea of what it would look like with the expectation that he'd draw a more finished piece for the final release. But by some mistake, the label went ahead and released it with this cover. Some of you may be thinking, well that's not so bad. But keep in mind that we're used to listening to music digitally, and album covers are usually pretty small on our screens. Meanwhile, this was released on vinyl, which is square foot in size, and needless to say, the little details look a lot worse when blown up to this size. The strangely drawn band logo, the wobbly motorcycle tires that clearly need to be aired up, the tacky fire effects on the album title, the wonky perspective on the man's arm, his seeming lack of a foot, seriously, it looks more like a hoof and his weird, angular, herpaderp caveman face. It's not bad for a proof of concept sketch, because again, that's all it was meant to be. The band was horrified that this was released, and a year later they re-released the album with this cover, which actually looks pretty good. It looks kind of like a vintage movie poster, although it is significantly different from the original cover, plus it misspelled the band's name. I mean, come on, there's no space in my battle axe. The cover was changed again at some point to this third one, which is used on streaming services, and it's much more accurate to the original as well as genuinely looking great. It's nice that this album has a happy ending. It's a classic case of being screwed by the label, which doesn't only happen to smaller bands either. In fact, something very similar happened to one of the juggernauts of metal. Not that Megadeth was as big in 1985 as they are now, in fact they'd only formed two years earlier after Dave Mustaine's alcohol abuse got him fired from his previous position as Metallica's lead guitarist. But their debut album, Killing Is My Business and Business Is Good, did attract a fair amount of attention upon release. Only it didn't look like this, it actually looked like this. I found out about this when doing research for my first censored lyrics video, but what exactly happened here? Well, the story of this album cover is actually very similar to that of the Burn This Town cover. Yes indeed, we have another case of executive meddling. The story has it that Dave drew a sketch of what he wanted on the album cover and sent it to their label, Combat Records, with the hopes that they would turn his sketch into a finished cover. Give them credit, they didn't just use Dave's sketch as a final cover. In fact, they apparently lost his sketch entirely. And for whatever reason, instead of asking him to send another copy of it, they just improvised their own cover that turned out like this. You know, this doesn't actually look that bad. Yeah, I kinda like this cover. 
All the elements are there. The chains, the bones, the knife. Even their mascot Vic Rattlehead doesn't look too terrible. That's pretty good memory given that the label lost the original sketch. Granted, Vic does kind of look like a Halloween prop, but hey, if anything, this gives the cover a lo-fi DIY feel that will become very popular in the years to come, as well as making it look kind of mystical and occult. But I suppose if I asked for one thing and the label delivered something different, I'd be annoyed too. Mustaine was mortified by the cover, but it wouldn't damage the band that much, as a year later they signed to Capitol Records, under which they would become one of the biggest thrash metal bands of the 80s and 90s. Until... It's not so good at well, if you've seen my Worst Censored Lyrics video, you know how this turns out. In 2002, Killing Is My Business was given a complete remaster, along with a censored version of these boots. And with the remaster came a new album cover that looks much closer to Dave's original design. It's nice that he finally got a cover that he was satisfied with. Or did he? Because in 2018, Killing Is My Business was remastered again with yet another new version of these boots, this time with Lee Hazelwood's original lyrics, and was given yet another new album cover, this time with more muted colors and a darker palette. Heck, this story may not even be over. We could see a fourth cover for Killing Is My Business released in the future. Who knows at this point? Most covers on this list were changed within a year of the album's original release, but this one was changed 17 years later, which begs the question, how late is too late to change an album cover? Try three decades. In 1987, guitar virtuoso Joe Satriani released his second album, Surfing with the Alien, which went platinum in the US and paved the way for other guitarists with Joe's trademark style. The album has nothing to do with surf rock or with aliens, but the cover certainly does, as it featured the Silver Surfer riding through the galaxy. This cover became iconic, and wound up gaining the Silver Surfer comics a number of new fans. The comic would go on to give Satriani several shoutouts, including naming a planet after him, and Joe named a few other tracks after elements from the comic, until 2018 when rebrand. Where's the surfboard? Where's the alien? You're the alien. I'm gonna hit you with the surfboard. What the hell happened here? Well, this change is rooted in the flawed and finicky nature of United States copyright law, and as a music industry miner, I'll try my best to explain this in a simple manner. The license to use the original cover art, which is a frame from the comics, was time limited but with options to renew for the coming years. Typically, this would involve the two parties coming to an agreement over how much money one would pay the other to use their image or character for the next few years. A number that was probably easier to agree on in 1987, when Marvel was just a big comics company, than it was 30 years later, when Marvel was a monolithic juggernaut of pop culture. Suddenly, the cost to keep using the Silver Surfer on the cover was way higher, and Satch decided that it wasn't worth the hassle. Considering Joe's previous positive relationship with Marvel, I kind of suspect that the price hike was Disney's fault. I don't have any sources to back this up, but when you consider that Disney is the company that made most of their biggest movies based on stories from the public domain, only to literally change the laws in the public domain, yeah, that does seem like the kind of copyright BS that Disney would pull, doesn't it? Seriously, screw Disney? I mean, it's not like Satch is entirely innocent when it comes to copyright either, given his earlier frivolous lawsuit of Coldplay due to them supposedly copying his song. But yeah, in 2018, Joe had to change the cover to this. This is a shame, because the Silver Server had been on the cover for more than 30 years and was the icon of the album for so long. But moreover, why was this the replacement? I hesitate to call this a bad album cover because I'm not even sure what it's meant to be. Is it just a distorted, color-filtered image of Joe? Is it abstract? Is it fire? Damn it, what is it? And why does it have the same font as the Now That's What I Call Music CDs? I bet this was made on a short notice when he knew he'd be losing the license, because a year after that, the cover was replaced once again with HOLY CRAP! Yo, that's actually badass! The silver guitar headstock flying through the vortex, making it look like some kind of otherworldly spaceship? See, this is a good album cover. It's just a shame that it still has nothing to do with surfing or aliens. Seriously, screw Disney! So far in this video, we've been having a lot of fun talking about these covers, but the last two are a lot more serious in nature. I had a hard time deciding which one would be number one, but I'm going to try to treat both of them with respect they deserve. In 1977, Leonard Skinner released their fifth album, Street Survivors. It went two times platinum and was propelled by the success of songs like That Smell and What's Your Name, as well as a cool album cover of the band standing in the street, surrounded by flames, looking like the survivors of some kind of post-apocalyptic dystopia. But tragedy struck on October 20th, 
three days after the album's release, when the band's plane ran out of fuel and crashed, killing six people, including guitarist Steve Gaines and lead singer Ronnie Van Zant. This brought the band to a screeching halt, and suddenly, the original cover was a lot more tasteless than they probably intended. The label quickly changed the cover to this picture of the band amidst a black backdrop, and absolutely no one could blame them. As cool as the old cover had been, it felt far too reminiscent of recent events. The band would eventually restore the original cover 30 years later, after enough time had passed, but even before it was restored, this cover wasn't unknown or anything. Skittered was a popular band! They had fans who bought the album and circulated copies with the original cover. And of course, the conspiracy theorists hopped on board. The most popular claim is that the flames only touch Ronnie and Steve, which is proof that they faked their deaths, or that their deaths were planned in advance. Okay, first of all, what does that even prove? If someone wanted to kill someone else, or fake their deaths, then logically, why would they leave cryptic hints in their album cover for people to find? And secondly, have you even seen the cover? Yes, the flames are touching Steve and Ronnie, but they're also touching everyone else! The entire place is on fire! I mean, look at this guy! His dick is on fire! Ouch! Bottom line, this fiery cover was probably made with the best of intentions, but was ruined by a tragic coincidence involving a plane crash that they had no control over. And incidentally, I can say all these exact same things about my number one pick. You had to know this was coming, right? And if you somehow don't know about this cover... Oh boy, this cover was out for a day, and it still became one of the most notorious changed album covers of all time. Little background. In 1992, Dream Theater released their sophomore album, Images and Words, which featured the epic song Metropolis Part 1, The Miracle and the Sleeper. In 1999, they followed that track with an entire album, Metropolis Part 2, Scenes from a Memory, a reincarnation-themed murder mystery rock opera. The following tour lasted until 2000, and the show in New York, featuring actors in a gospel choir, was recorded and would be released the following year as live scenes from New York. Just one issue. This album was released on September 11th, 2001. It was bad enough that this album was released on 9-11, although it was far from the only album released that day. But the fact that it was recorded in New York and featured this cover art originally? Yeah, that's a whole lot of yikes. I mean, I get what they were going for. It's a reference to the Images and Words cover with the heart on fire, but it's an apple on fire representing New York or the Big Apple. I'm sure they meant it metaphorically, like they're gonna set the town on fire with their music. But then if that wasn't bad enough, they included the Twin Towers in the flames. Give Street Survivors this, at least that was a few days before the accident. This album cover aged badly on the day of its release. This has to be the mother of unfortunate coincidences. Unless, maybe... Dream Theater did 9-11? Nah, it was just a bad coincidence. Nothing more, nothing less. Keep in mind, album covers from major artists are typically planned out at least a month in advance. They have whole teams and spend thousands making the covers look just right. If the cover is gonna be changed, it has to be for a damn good reason. Live Scenes from New York was pulled immediately and was later re-released with this cover. Honestly, the controversy about the original cover may have given them free publicity. Copies of the CD with the original cover are now valued as collector's items and have sold for hundreds of dollars, and the album charted in several countries and managed to sell over 28,000 copies after its re-release. Pretty good sales for a live album from a prog band. Well, that's my list. Do you know of any other album covers that would change after release? Leave them in the comments below and I'll catch you next time. But wait, I hear some of you say, aren't you gonna talk about the Scorpion's Virgin Killer cover? I mean, that's one of the most notorious changed album covers in history. It attracted controversy as recently as 2008. I mean, come on, you have to talk about that album cover. No, no, I don't. Seriously, screw Disney?